Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin. The Pombero is a creature described in the mythology of northeast Argentina, Paraguay, and southern Brazil. Other names for the creature in native Guarani mean hairy feet and lord of the night, and the Spanish called the creature man of the night. Perhaps not surprisingly, El Pombero is allegedly a nocturnal creature. It is said to be the size of a seven-year-old child, with an ugly countenance and smooth, dark skin like a velveteen doll. The Pombero has its origins in what is called Old Tupian, meaning that the word, and therefore the concept of the Pombero, predates the Portuguese and Spanish Jesuit standardization of the region's language, which occurred sometime in the 16th century. We also know that humans have been in the area for around 10,000 years. Some say more, some say less. So the concept of the Pombero can be dated anywhere in between these two dates. And I always find it interesting to consider just how different a place the world was back then, and to muse over what just may have been around that we have yet to sink our chisels in. I condensed the data about the Pombero into four central themes. First, there is a widespread custom, particularly in Paraguay, that residents of rural communities will leave offerings for the creature somewhere on their property. Second, it is said to have hairy feet. Third, people will not mimic its whistles, whoops, and cries. And the fourth, regards female fertility and impregnation. Of course, these matters are typically considered superstition, a play on old mythology, and no doubt it is, but that doesn't mean that it didn't originate from a very real place. See, the public reaction to the palm barrow is exactly and startlingly consistent with what we should expect if, in fact, a small species of human or human-like thing inhabits the South American jungles. And, of course, many would say they do. If these things are real, then the mythology or legend is remarkably consistent to what would be expected. In fact, if Pombero-like creatures were discovered tomorrow, then it would be surprising if they didn't follow this behavior. First, People in the region of rural Paraguay leave gifts of rum, tobacco, honey, cured meats, or chocolate for the Pombero. There seems to be a very real belief that if someone's homestead, again, these are very rural places, that if someone's homestead is being plagued with nocturnal issues, then a Pombero is to blame, and that the gifts left for the miscreant ensure that he will simply move on to the next place. This is, in a strange way, similar to mob activity to which primates big and small are quite familiar with. And specifically, I would argue that Hominin, that's you and I and others like us, took the matter to a whole new level. For example, foxes are certainly opportunistic predators, but the fox doesn't stop the rabbit and say, give me one leg or its equal value of mice and I'll leave you alone for a year. This threat or treat mentality has been a favorite of everyone from the Huns to the Viking to Al Capone to big government. Pay us tribute and nothing horrible will happen to you. This is why we didn't negotiate with pirates, and why we don't negotiate with terrorists or hackers, or used to not, anyway. And though in nature, opportunism dominates, I would argue that it is a particularly defining characteristic of humanity and things close to it, which is certainly the implication of the Pombero's nature. Though I'd also argue that the relatively lowly hominid would also prove willing and able to contrive such a heist. Give me something or there'll be hell to pay is a tried and true strategy of mankind, one that could be easily understood by something similar. It's a relatively simple mix of risk reduction and action reward conditioning. Like I said, opportunism dominates the order of things all the way down the line, and there's no such thing as a free lunch, unless of course you're terribly clever. But even then it's not free, because were that the case, additional energy is still required to operate the brain that can comprehend such a concept in the first place. This particular method of resource collection is uniquely human, or some would say human-like, because if you leave an offering for a bear, it'll just want more and look for more. But perhaps a more sophisticated mind thinks a little more long-term, and perhaps prefers not to linger, lest expose itself to risk. Though I'll admit, I could be reading too much into this in terms of the creature's intelligence. Take, for example, a crocodile. People get away with this craziness because the beasts are full, and their long-lived experience has taught them that they will be fed in the near future, so they accept what is offered in exchange for forgetting that they're super predators, as well as not eating each other. So that's an example of a similar premise, or slightly similar, I guess, that occurs without massive brain power.
though I am a huge believer in this, there is no reliable methodology to truly quantify non-human intelligence. Which is ironic, because IQ is one of the few human qualities that we actually can reliably quantify. If the palm barrow is hominin, that is, human enough to be human, though not human, in quotes I guess, not human enough to be homo sapien, then it would make sense that this strategy is relatively thought out. And in order for the belief to be so prolific today, they must have wielded it to a profound effect. Imagine raccoons so aggressive that people still wrap up their cans 500 years after the raccoons died out. But of course, if the thing is more primitive, like a hominid, like some sort of upright chimpanzee, which for some reason people have trouble believing could exist, then the strategy may be less thought out, or slightly less thought out, and simply a matter of, if it works, it works. So keep doing it. And the last thing I want to mention regarding this first quality, I don't really mean to imply that Pombero-like creatures are taking candied yams and cigarettes from front porches all throughout the region. At least today, I doubt that's pervasive by any definition. But make no mistake, the tradition certainly came from somewhere. And no doubt, somewhere fascinating. Okay, number two. The Pombero is said to have hairy feet. Now, from what I can gather, this is not so much a result of eyewitness reports. Likely, this is more indicative of the creature's behavior more so than any physical feature. Likely, the palm barrow is alleged to have hairy feet because it can come and go silently and leave little evidence, or only ambiguous evidence of its passage. Because if such a creature does indeed exist, not only in mythology, but in the jungle, then such a creature would need to employ near superhuman levels of stealth. To me, hairy feet is a trait that metaphorically indicates the creature's slyness, cunning craft, and muted footfalls. And there is certainly a cultural precedent for this metaphor. I'll cite everyone's favorite ring destroyer. So not only is there a precedent for the human metaphor, but for the alleged creature's behavioral trait as well. It is a proven fact that chimps will walk in a single file line to hide their numbers, and will likewise go out of their way to walk on substrate that is not conducive to leaving tracks. Like I said just a moment ago, if these creatures exist, then they have a near superhuman level of stealth. Well, I think technically, chimpanzee actually do possess superhuman qualities, definitionally. And as far as stealth is concerned, ask any primatologist. It is exceedingly difficult to find a primate that doesn't want to be found. Even orangutan are notorious for being hard to film because of their skepticism toward new stimuli. The great apes come to you not the other way around. So for me, it isn't really a stretch to assume that there very well may be a species observant enough to realize that it really doesn't want to be found. It watched the consequence of that for 10,000 years. So if a mere chimp can not only be aware of its spore, but then as a social collection take steps to minimize it as a coordinated group effort, then imagine what a creature 10 steps further than a chimp may be capable of. This, too, has a very real correlation with what should be expected from a flesh-and-blood animal, as far as I can see, at least. And, of course, a taxonomic description is required to understand the true depth of this creature's thought process. Third, people say, don't mimic it. It is said to whistle to make its presence known and communicate with others of its kind. It's also known to make screams and cries and many people in the region that the alleged creature dwells will not mimic the call for fear of coming off as antagonizing, mocking, or otherwise attracting the creature. Again, this just seems to be an awful sensible response to a flesh-and-blood creature. It's probably not wise to start making jaguar calls either, particularly when you realize we're literally talking about people who spend a considerable amount of time in the forest. Universally speaking, it is generally smart to not speak unless you know what you're saying. But also, you should probably have something to say, because otherwise, you don't know what you're saying, and you may not like the response. So I won't linger on this topic for too long. It's pretty cut and dry. Don't speak if you don't know what you're saying. Don't make a bird call if you don't want to see said bird. And don't attract something you don't want to see. And finally, and I think it's easy to argue that this is the most disturbing, it is said that the palm barrow can impregnate a woman merely by touching her, typically while she is asleep. So the mythology goes, if a single woman becomes pregnant with no explanation, and the child is unspeakably ugly and doesn't survive, then it was the work of the palm barrow. Now, this one does sound rather taboo and strictly folkloric, but 
this lore actually seems to be pervasive enough for people in the region to have sympathy for women who this occurs to, which seems like an oddly specific thing for people to have a universal agreement upon. Again, I'm not suggesting that this is happening today, but as far as tradition is concerned, it makes an uncomfortable amount of sense, especially when you consider paleo tradition. And I know this gets weird for a lot of reasons, but it is well understood that humans and Neanderthal interbred, and the terms of that interaction are poorly understood. Same with Denisovans, and they apparently got around, seeing as the modern humans with the highest percentage of Denisovan DNA can be found in the Philippines, Australia, and Iceland. Which is particularly curious, because the fragments of Denisovan remains that we found come from Siberia, and no one nearby presents Denisovan in their genome. I guess all I mean to say is that populations do in fact get around, and, shall we call it breeding, is extremely complicated between two humans, let alone between two human species. And in terms of species, where you start is clearly not always where you end up, and the road can be long and winding. And on a more specific level of where this belief came from, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's easy to see why such a creature may be opportunistic in more than just resource acquisition, but also opportunistic in terms of something that's perhaps more of a desire and curiosity than a need. This element is also pervasive in Bigfoot folklore, and you could say that's because it's part of the human psyche, and nothing more. Well, maybe, but what if it's not? Nothing else motivates a creature quite like that one impulse I'm discussing, and no one should be surprised by the thought of going about it amorally, because I have some very unpleasant suspicions about how that very well may have gone down in regards to Homo sapien, Neanderthal, and Denisovans, and others too. No doubt it was very dark. Or maybe the three species all lived in harmony, in loving peace where everyone accepted everyone else's differences, and they rode around on unicorns too. That seems just as likely, in my sad opinion. It's very important to keep in mind that perversion tends to linger around the bottom and the top of societal dominance hierarchies, meaning there's no shortage of soldiers or leaders, supply and demand. So the fact that such a creature has a sinister and uncouth element, well, again, that really should be expected. Honestly, I'm not knowledgeable enough to describe this in a way that is consistent with how the researchers define it. I don't really understand. I'm not sure if they do or if they even think they do. But it seems that Homo sapiens interbred with four other species of non-Homo sapien humans. That's Neanderthal, Denisovan, and two unknowns. Again, I'm not really knowledgeable enough to explain how they know something specifically enough to know that they don't know. But that is the prevailing sentiment. And quite frankly, this is a concept that should emblaze even the most skeptical of curmudgeon's sense of wonder. I think it is entirely appropriate that the Pombero would be regarded as everything from annoying to offending. If these types of things exist, then the surrounding traditions fit in a real-world hypothesis of a small species of human or human-like thing subsisting in the forest. There are two ways to look at the Pombero. Mythology, nothing more than legend, superstition, or not. So, of course, mythologically speaking, the Pombero makes sense, because how could it not? It's mythology. Mythology is not known for its probability. Looking at you, Greece, but in the case of the Pombero, it makes sense as an actual claim. You could say that the related customs and perceptions, leaving offerings, not mimicking it, stealthy attributes, and all the taboo stuff are nothing but superstition. That wonderful merge of mythology and tradition that comprise some of our most treasured memories and affinities. Or it's not. Because make no mistake, if such a creature exists, or even existed until relatively recently, then this is exactly the profile we'd expect. Which is curious. I think for some reason, we have a tendency to assume the most boring of science. I think that's safe to say. And we can forgive the scientists for that. Because common logic dictates that the most probable outcome is often the most predictable. But we've been wrong about the interesting so many times. But that was long ago, right? One of my favorite examples is the dinosaurs. For the longest time, dinosaurs were thought of as saurian giant iguanas that lumber like big lizards. T-Rex was thought to be a rigid creature that used its nose to find the formidable odor of decaying giants. And Triceratops was depicted as sprawled like a lizard. Then finally, paleontologists said, no, no, the Triceratops was built straight-legged, like a rhino, 
and T-Rex was limber and balanced like a bird. Then we started to realize that both characters were represented by fossils that had been to hell and back. Teeth marks, horn stabs, broken ankles, stabbed out jaws. Many wounds healed, others not so much. And the lumbering iguanas, slowly and then rather abruptly, became understood as they are today. Dynamic, colorful and complex, and generally more intriguing than anyone guessed even a mere 50 years ago. I saw something like this on the internet, and it really resonated with me. If for some terrible reason, birds had gone extinct millions of years ago, and all we had were fossils, they would likely be depicted as something like this. And that's because science is conservative. You can only really be certain about what you know, and speculation can always be saved for later. And I think we've done the same thing with hominoids. We made them bland, and passive, reactive to their environment instead of a force to be reckoned with in themselves. Their depictions, and in my opinion, their general interpretation by the public at large, seem awfully narrow. Most textbooks, and even documentaries, will depict, say an Australopithecine, as something like this. Stoic. Which again is understandable. They're only going with what is known for certain. Scientists knew they were upright, that their skull and face is somewhere between that of a chimp and that of a person, only much closer to chimp. Life was tough, so they look glum. We know they understood objects to some degree, so maybe one has a stick for some reason. But that's about all we can know. Though fortunately, I think anthropologists are catching on. Or at least agreeing, maybe I should say. This depiction of an Australopithecine is from as recently as the 90s. Then compare it to this more modern interpretation. And I love when this happens. It's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. A lot of our perception of Austro has to do with how skillfully an artist can actually recreate it. So the more it's represented as an agile, sentient creature, the easier it is for us to see it as such. Perhaps their behavior was so dynamic that it would essentially make them unrecognizable by the walking with prehistoric beasts standard. And it's important to remember, even iron is little more than dust after 2,000 years. So virtually all of the finer trappings that these creatures may have enjoyed certainly couldn't survive the test of time. It wasn't altogether so long ago that scientists said stuff like, there's no reason to believe that, quote, early man had language. And it's like, what were you expecting to find their memoirs? And you could say that the level of behavioral cryptography I'm suggesting for such a thing to still be alive today is a stretch, and it may be, but think of the bird of paradise. Nothing about the recovery of this little skull, spinal column, or ankle joint can properly paint the picture of a creature that possesses the most beautiful colors imaginable. Nor would a fossil depict that the creature dedicates a huge chunk of its life to perfecting song and dance, or perhaps collecting the shinies. All I mean to say is that there is always a lot of room for behavior, and even morphology, and morphological features and characteristics that no one really expects. There is a difference between saying, this organism had a complex vocal structure, and hearing the warbles of a warbler, or the tomfoolery of a macaw. So nowadays, no scientist really has an issue with saying non-human primates and other species of humans were probably quite clever. Yeah, but what does that mean? What can we extrapolate from that? What does that mean we should come to expect? I don't know, but there's an awful lot of intriguing theories. Whenever I read about or hear discussion of the Pombero, or any other number of similar ilk, I'm always shocked as to how people never seem to acknowledge that such creatures are depicted in the fossil record, the woefully incomplete fossil record, I should add. And of course, Australopithecines are just one example. They were indeed the size of children, and were undoubtedly capable, and probably willing, to commit strange, human-like acts, even though they're not really depicted that way. And no one knows what came before Austro, and we know that they didn't contribute to humans. So no one knows what became of what is literally used as the textbook example for the term wastebasket taxon. But no one seems bothered by that. No one seems particularly troubled by what that implies. But of course, not all examples of proven Pombero-type creatures are quite so ancient. Take, for example, the so-called human hobbit, H. floresiensis, it is kind of painted as this more or less somber, if not thoughtful, creature. But that's because we often think of them as pre-human, or somehow less than human. But that's not really correct, seeing as they existed fully within our modern form. They were our contemporaries, and the few bone fragments and stone implements we have that represent our entire knowledge of them are entirely incapable of presenting their behavior. And I guess this kind of goes back to the dinosaur and bird analogies I made. I think things may have been more interesting than we generally think. 
because how could we know? Other than mythology, of course. We know H. Flores certainly had stone tools and weapons. Well, yeah, that's really all we could have, right? And at three and a half feet tall, we know they hunted small elephants and giant rodents. And we know they shared an environment with Komodo dragons. In my opinion, mundane is not a word that could be applied to these creatures. Not one little bit. Because remember, if these things were human, which of course they were, then they certainly did weird things. And in this case, weird means innovative. Things that really have no precedent in the non-human world. You know, risky things that have no clear motive from the perspective of an outside observer, but range from entertainment to status enhancement or even a simple cure for boredom. I think they likely would have been quite colorful, perhaps even quirky in their nature and their very human obsessions and endeavors, and even demons. Maybe our understanding of these creatures as reactive to their environment is not entirely accurate, and instead of being the hapless victims of nature's wrath, beating their chest and dying stoically, maybe they knew what they were doing. Maybe they knew what it took to survive, and perhaps they still do. Surviving, and perhaps even thriving, would likely have required a certain level of, let's say, impishness. Perhaps they were fast, and clever, and more human-like than anyone currently suspects. I mean, they were human, so I guess I should say, perhaps they were more like us than anyone really predicts. And for the record, whether or not they used fire, and how they communicated, are matters of contention, though it is accepted that Neanderthal used fire, and likely Denisovans too. It also remains a mystery as to whether or not sapiens like you and I ever came into contact with Floresiensis, but imagine if a population of humans moved into an area where H. Flores dwelled. I can only imagine that contact would at least begin with something very much like the palm arrow in some ways benign, and perhaps abhorrent in others. Four-foot-tall creatures that move in ways that can't be tracked, in a way that seems beyond the skill of any mere animal, because of course that's exactly what it is. They are taxonomically classified as beyond animals, so their behavior would likely be quite disturbing. Perhaps they would make such a coordinated mess, trying to get at valuables, that people would soon learn it was simply easier to appease these wood demons than combat them. Perhaps the diminutive hominin would have been like the Marine Corps of raccoons. Then after the gift-giving began, a parasitic relationship would ensue. The small hominin theory also, unsettlingly, fits in with the Pombero's interest in women, and perhaps even an ugly child. Because don't forget, Floresiensis is considered human, just like Neanderthal and Denisovan, though there's no evidence that sapiens and Flores ever interbred, at least in a surviving population of sapiens. Maybe a little ironic because of the time gap, but I think we're still largely looking at the hominin in the same way that we used to incorrectly look at the dinosaurs. But not merely in the physical sense, but in the sense of their behavior. For a long time it was maintained that dinosaurs were asocial, belly-dragging, lumbering creatures of muted colors. Of course, we no longer believe that to be the case. Perhaps our own relations are more behaviorally dynamic than anyone suspects. And perhaps that energetic behavior manifested in ways that we currently don't consider possible. Life tends to err that way. And then perhaps consider that the primate fossil record, as of some five million years ago, is absolutely full of pomberos. And then consider that it is universally agreed upon that the primate fossil record is nowhere close to complete. It is maintained that only 5% of species have been described. And strangely enough, that number is actually going down, because the species we find and describe are outnumbered by the necessary intermediates between them. At least, so they say that's how it goes. And back to the Australopithecines, which long predate Floresiensis, they're often depicted as these upright chimps who spent a lot of time bashing the ground and screaming. Sure, but they also may have been utterly Pombero-esque. Many First Nation cultures had a variation of a creature called the Thunderbird, and yes, it had a mythological element, as did all the creatures of their world, but it was also commonly depicted on totems beside very real creatures, which has led some to believe that the Thunderbird is actually an ancestral memory, by way of mythology, of the Terratorn. The Terratorn was a New World vulture with a 13-foot wingspan, and it well overlapped with human settlement of the continent, present until at least 12,000 years ago. Is it possible that the Pombero, the concept of which dates back at least 500 years, which is actually as far back as we even feasibly have the potential to know, has its origin in ancestral memory, by way of mythology? Or maybe take it a step further, what if it's not merely a memory at all? Well, 
Modern science would say that's impossible, and not without reason. There is no fossil record of anything like that in South America, or in North America, in regards to the equally as pervasive hominoid that is consistently described. Well, there is not a single fossil specimen of this hominoid, which is quite intriguing, so that, at least, is absolute proof that great apes, hominoids, whatever, can exist and leave no trace or point of origin, which is curious for a lot of reasons. So, something similar-ish perhaps could leave a similar lack of record, especially if that similar-ish thing was more in the direction that inexplicably dominated the past few million years. It's not like it's going to wander into a tar pit, and even if it did, help would be nearby. Okay, now comes the part that I never like. There is no compelling video or physical evidence for the Pombero, whatsoever. This is an example of some Pombero footage found on YouTube. And pro tip, if a big red arrow is ever required to make out what you're looking at, it's not great evidence. Not to suggest that these things would be easy to spot, but in terms of actual provable evidence, it's usually junk. And in my opinion, it shows a person playing chicken, or that's what I called it when I was a kid. When you put your legs through the sleeves of your sweater, of course, now I'd call it a trip to the chiropractor. Here is another clip. This one comes from Paraguay, and it actually looks pretty decent, which is why I really don't like film analysis. It's just so open to interpretation, and like so much of this, means nothing at the end of the day, at least to the skeptic. But to say that there's no evidence of the Pombero isn't really correct. I think a more accurate way to put it is that there's no evidence for a living Pombero. Because this description of another type of person-like non-animal, this existed for the overwhelming majority of human history. But you know, now must be the exception to the rule. In fact, literally since I started recording this video, a new hominin has been described. The palm barrow, and others like it, are obviously figures of mythology and tradition, but at least to me, the creatures themselves and the traditions that surround them seem suspiciously tangible. And the more we learn about our family tree, the more correlation we find, not less. And as far as the uncouth implications of such a creature are concerned, I'll let you decide if that fits into your perception of reality. Though again, it has been proven to happen just like small humans were indeed discovered long after anyone expected, and they were clearly adept at survival, and perhaps they thrived in hostile environments. We homo sapiens tame our environments to make them suitable for us. Perhaps there's a human that doesn't. When this was labeled a legend, we did not yet know that it once existed, prolifically and rather recently all things considered. And of course, the timeline remains unclear at best, and the record remains incomplete, and you know, I'm first to admit, I would not be surprised at all to learn that we're looking at all of this incorrectly, in some major and unforeseen way. But that's just a suspicion. And then, of course, there is a whole and entirely different stance on small, human-like creatures coming and going and imposing themselves upon humanity. But perhaps that's a matter for a different time. Anyway, make sure to like this video and subscribe because that really helps me make more of them and I appreciate all the open minds. Anyway, again, and as always, thanks an awful lot for listening.